Hi, this is Jazz with me, Isaiah. Good evening. Uh, this is a special episode. I'm in Tadbury, uh, United Kingdom, and we are right here at Modern World Studios. Now, this is unique and different from what you normally uh, see. First of all, my guest here is Mr. Craig. Good to have you, sir. Fantastic. Nice to be here. Uh, it's an honor to, to actually meet you and and of course the guys will uh, my audience will get to understand why for me it's a great honor and uh, an opportunity to meet you thank you uh, this is a show where we, we talk about jazz but we talk about the music industry and one of the reasons why I requested that I, I you know I have a moment with you is because I think it's a great opportunity to hear from um, a, a legendary um, expat in the music industry where you're not just a musician, but you're a producer, you're, you, you name it, um, in regards to music industry. We are hungry, I'm, personally I'm hungry to, uh, for the sake of my, my country and my, uh, our music industry in Uganda and East Africa also, uh, we need to learn a lot, but I don't even know where to start asking from you because I know as a musician, you've, uh, you've, you've learned a lot. You've learned a lot, you've, uh, you've dealt with many people, but I'm going to ask you briefly to just share with us some of the people that you've worked with, because I know you've worked with huge people, you know. Well, I'm originally American, so yeah. I grew up in USA, and I had the privilege of having a, an American uh, music education, yeah. and I had a technology education too. I did physics at MIT in Boston, playing all the time different, mostly classical and jazz at the same time. So mm -hmm. uh, America has a great tradition of big bands. Yeah. So when I decided to come to England, mm -hmm. uh, when I, was this? I was drawn 1973, wow. almost 40 years ago. Wow. Yeah. And I was drawn because of the experimental rock that was coming out of England, the amazing studio sounds, mm -hmm. amazing engineers, amazing mm -hmm. producers, and the songwriting. Was a, Legendary, both classical, but also the the experimental rock, and of course, mm. you had the well, Beatles, yeah. you know, the Beatles, and, yeah. the and uh, so there there was this standard of music being made. So when I first came to England, I came with two programmable synthesizers, the early programmable uh, what call ARP twenty six hundred mm -hmm. synthesizers, and they just became portable enough you could bring them on an airplane and bring them over. Before they would take the size of this room up these synthesizers with wires coming out. It looked like the switchboard to control Mumbai or something. So when I came, I started immediately doing session work. Mm -hmm. I started audition auditioning with bands. Mm -hmm. And I started a band that was in the mold of Weather Report, uh, Chick Corea's Return to Forever, a Ma Vishnu Orchestra, mm -hmm. experimental jazz rock. And uh, we were doing all the college circuit and eventually we got a ra record contract. Mm -hmm. And a lot of musicians in London heard about this band, and I started getting session work and arranging work and all kinds of things. So mm -hmm. within four or five years of that, I was producing one of the premier artists in the UK, Sir Cliff Richard. Doing Cliff Richard. Yeah. So I was doing all the arrangements and production. I produced all the records. And I, I wrote a, the title track for the Silver album, uh, and that gave me a good budgets. Really wow. good budgets, yeah. you know, brass sections, string sections. I would do my own string arrangements, and I, because I was classically trained, I could mm -hmm. read scores. I could I could generate string parts, and yeah. being a brass player, trumpet player, I could uh, oversee my own brass sections or get big brass sections in. We did one Christmas single called a "Little Town." Mm -hmm. We got all the brass brass players in in London, twenty in the room together at Abbey Road Studios. Wow. and made this sound, it was the most fantastic sound for a Christmas single that was in the top ten of the charts. Wow. Very satisfying to be able to have your ideas and have a, a, an audience like that. Mm -hmm. All the time though I was in the mainstream, what you could consider Cliff, Sir Cliff Richard, mm -hmm. Cliff Richard as people know him, yeah. as pop music, I was also involved with very experimental electronic music. Mm -hmm. And I kept going with my band and all my experimentations. Mm -hmm. I retrained in Indian classical music in 1980. Indian? Because I thought it was like one of the most sophisticated and most uh, 
uh, involved of all the music systems. And I thought, if I don't know this, I can't call myself a complete musician. Wow. So I started, I very seriously started uh, this study and discipline of sitar and study of Indian music. Uh, I didn't know that it would come in by, into my mainstream work until I did a film called Baji on the Beach, 1993, which um, involved Western score but using Indian elements. It's for an Indian director yeah. who did, went on to make Bend It Like Beckham, which I also scored. Number one UK film, Bride and Prejudice, another number one UK film, which got to use all my knowledge of Indian music but how to incorporate it from rock bands, funk bands, reggae bands, hold, hold jazz a second. bands. Hold a second, because I need, I need my, my audience to understand that you, you scored um, for Bend It Like Beckham, uh, Bride and Prejudice, Bride and Prejudice um, Baji on the Beach, Baji on the Beach, What's Baji the, on the Beach was the first one. Was the first one. Not so well known, Yeah. but uh, it started the whole thing off and it was unexpected. I didn't know I was going to be drawing my Indian music knowledge mm -hmm. into my work. Wow. And don't forget, before I came to England, I lived in Kenya for two years. Kenya? And I was at the Conservatory of Music in Nairobi, Kenya for two years, 1971 to 73. I was first trumpet with the symphony orchestra. I had a really good band called Mashada, which is a Santana type band. Yeah. Well, uh, the Kenyans we, in the band. No, it was all white white British, except for me being a white, a white uh, American. American. Yeah. And we played all the clubs doing British rock with a Santana twist. We did a couple of Santana things. Did you, did you perform in Mombasa? Uh, Mombasa, Malindi, uh, Nairobi. Um, uh, we didn't get to Lamo. I used to love Lamo, but uh, yeah. it's, uh, they didn't really have the clubs there. But no, ma mainly in Nairobi and all the clubs. Wow. And we'd just play all night. You know, It was that time when a good rock band we had our following. They used to follow us all around. Wow. And it was uh, it was then that I thought I'm gonna to come to England because all the good music I liked was was from me here. Was coming out of UK. So I, East Africa's in my blood. Wow. And of course you've been to Uganda. Yes. We're gonna go into that. So uh tell me, apart from all that rich musical background you also have an element of management and and, and uh, a talent something. Tell me about that. Because how I met you, I actually thought you were a manager of, of artists or something like that. It just took it's, me for a It's funny. Ma many people <laughs> think that because I'm the Mzungu in the band. <laughs> and yeah. so they think, oh, he must be the guy in charge. But really, I joined the Ganta Boys as musician and songwriter and producer, of course, I, I have a lot of experience in production. Yeah. And it immediately was put to good use with the Ganda Boys. And, uh, but the thing to remember is we're self-managed. Yeah. And all three of us with the Ganda Boys, Dennis Mugaga, mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Sibagude, and myself, yeah. we all three share the management equally. Wow. And, you know, I do my best to manage myself <laughs> yeah. as well. Uh, for film composing, I have very good management, professional management, who can organize all the orchestras because it's a specialist field. So I have yeah. a, a management team behind me for that. They wow. love the Ganda Boys, what we're doing, uh, and uh, hopefully one day I can make, bring all the worlds together, the film world and the Ganda Boys and Ugandan music all together. Well, also... It's, it's a dream. Yeah. Uh, but if we can't have dreams, what can we have? <laughs> our, you know. But if, I, if, if it was up to me, I think I would call you a musicologist. Because your, your desire to understand music from different angles is amazing. Uh, because the fact that you, 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 you have a, mu a musical background from the American perspective. Yeah, that's right. Then uh, you, prat you played there as well. Because I know you mentioned that you played a lot in New York. That's right. And a bit in Boston. That's right. And then you went to Kenya, which is also another surprise. So you have an African element or oh, understanding of it. Uh, I, I know that in the scores you also do a lot of African drumming That's and, right. and all that. Then you uh, you have done a lot of this in the UK and as well as done the Indian. I mean, that's, that's awesome. That's amazing. But uh, tell us, uh, we are in Uganda. We we don't have this this really this much expertise. We try to figure out things ourselves and try to. Um, we don't have schools. We don't have um, musicianship. 
that, that will change. Or that that like. will change. We're doing whatever we can. We we use the resources we have. Mm -hmm. But when we when I meet someone like you, and I know you've been there, mm -hmm. what I don't understand from your perspective, what position you think we are at, and what mm -hmm. we need to do. That's a good but, question. Yeah. I would answer it this this way that the state of the Ugandan music industry is very similar to what it was in America in the 1940s, in the 1950s. Do you know what that would mean? That would mean we are 70 years <laughs> Yes, but look, look but, yeah, but hold on. Mm -hmm. Look at the great music that's come, that came out of the 50s. They're still playing it all over the radio station. True. It's raw. It's got incredible energy. Mm -hmm. The trouble at that, at that time, the artists didn't have many rights. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of corruption. Yeah. There was payola corruption, so they would have to pay to get their songs played on the radio. Is it? All in America. And it's until they pass laws yeah. and put all this new structure in place. Yeah. It's a development that every culture goes through in, in this thing called media. Because what happens, you get sharks coming. People can make a lot of money from media. If they're the gatekeepers standing from where the records get sold, you know, they, they make sure the artists don't get it. You know, they're kind of, they're standing at the door collecting the money, you know. And in every culture, it's already happened in India. India's just starting to come out of it. Uh, East Africa's